You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. This is Paris of the Agros, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Hour, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Hey everybody, welcome to Bods Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bod Father. And as always, I'm bringing you guys and gals awesome interviews. Agros is the new instrumental hardcore slash metal brand from the OG cro Mag songwriter and founder, Paris Mayhew. And Agros has released their debut album entitled Rise of the Agros. And they have singles, City Kids, and a remix of Chaos Magic featuring chuck linehan of crumb suckers on lead guitar so paris welcome to the podcast and glad to have you on here my friend thank you for having me thank you for sharing your audience with me not a problem whatsoever so let's get right into this how long have you been wanting to put out an album and were you a little nervous uh, about it possibly or no well i didn't plan to make an album i just started writing songs and and uh, ended up recording one or two. And uh, the first one I finished was Chaos Magic. And when it was finished, I was just driving around in my car, listening to it for like two years with no intention of putting it out. It was just something that I had done for my own pleasure. You know, I work in the film business as a camera operator and uh, my schedule is just really hectic. I, I work five days a week, 13, 14 hours a day on TV shows and movies back to back for years and years and years. I mean, since the pandemic ended, I was working con- continuously. But um, I just completed the song and uh, and uh, I, I'd been kind of trying to play, put together bands with a few people, but it just wasn't working out the way I wanted it to. And you know, then I would just find myself driving around listening to the song, thinking to myself, well, you know, why am I looking for other people to get something done when this that's coming out of my speakers is exactly what I want to hear? Nope. So I decided to make a video for it. And I made the video for Chaos Magic. And uh, and then I when I after, I, you know, when I was, you know, literally pressing, you know, send on YouTube to to post the video, I realized, you know, I have to put a name on it. So it wasn't like I was forming, you know, I didn't have this like plan to form this band or make this record or anything. I just, I was, I was, you know, I actually during those times driving around, I was thinking about, oh, maybe I can come up with some other framework for my music and maybe come up with a story uh, for a TV show or something that where there's a band and the band will play these songs. Like, and you'll see the band write these songs, like somebody sitting in a room playing the intro to Chaos Magic. And then later on, a couple episodes later, you see them play it in a rehearsal studio. And then by the end there, you know, like that kind of thing. So I decided to make the music video to kind of present the look of the TV show that I wanted to present, which I thought would be the, this dark New York vision, you know, more like a Fort Apache, the Bronx or the Warriors, as opposed to, you know, the way people see New York City now, which is a very friendly, clean place. And once I had that video out and I, and I, and I took the name from the script idea, I had aggros and put it on the video agros were born really and and agros is really just a vehicle for my songwriting really no different than the chromags the chromags i just view as a vehicle for my songwriting and i left those songs in that vehicle and i moved on in in my creative life into the film business and then when i decided to start doing it again i just needed to create another vehicle people you know it's like that movie tucker the francis ford coppola movie where this guy, you know, Tucker had this idea to make the greatest car in the world. Like he invented seat belts and all these other things that cars never had. And, but he didn't have a car. He didn't have the money to make the car. So he had someone just draw a picture of the car and they put it in a magazine. And then suddenly he got all this financing because people saw it in a magazine. So they believed it was real. Mm. And it was called the Tucker. And it was, you know, people, once people see it in a context, they believe it's real. And so I presented the agros as a band 
in that music video. Like you'll watch if you watch the video Chaos Magic, it looks like there's like 30 people in the video, but it's all me. After recording this album, has this left the door open for another one, possibly for the future or no? No, of course, of course. Like now that I've found this new vehicle for my songwriting, this will be it forever. You know, when I did the Chromex, it was kind of like I, I, I entered into it with a partner. And uh, when that partnership wasn't satisfying to me anymore, I moved on. But I just like left all the creative things that I did there and just moved on to a different creative space. But now I've kind of forged a new place for my music to uh, to live. And uh, I, there's no reason for it to ever end. I will, you know, whatever I create musically will come out under the brand Agros. And I hope to, you know, build it and uh, grow it. You know, right now I'm about to take the band on, on, the, on the road in July. And I got the drummer who played most of the stuff on the record and the piano player and Chuck Lenahan from the Crumb Suckers. And, but, you know, who knows what form it's going to take you know, I, I would be happy if the, these four guys and I just continued to make music for a long, 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 long time. But mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, I guess I've kind of let go of that attachment to the idea of, of a traditional band. I love playing with these guys, but if if they all decided that they had, you know, to move someplace else or do, you know, pursue some other creative endeavor. I, it, it wouldn't change anything. I would just continue to make music and put it under this aggro's band. I think of the aggro is more like, you know, like a, a group like Daft Punk where there are like two people in the group that are kind of like the, the voices of the, of the music. And then they just kind of surround themselves with other people. Now I know you made this record in increments, like, like puzzle pieces, like you mentioned by recording bass, drums, guitar, et cetera, whenever you could, because you was working at the time. But looking back on this now, man, how good does it feel to have this out and be like, yeah, this is, this is really cool. You know, I'm kind of astonished because like, I, like you said, I did do it in as little pieces, puzzle pieces, you know, recording a bass track here, recording drum tracks there, sitting with the drum tracks for years. Sometimes like I recorded fear view mirror with Roy Mayorga in his backyard studio one day, just because he, you know, I went to out to LA. I brought that white guitar right there with me and I posted on Facebook, you know, JFK to LAX, you know, that's all I posted. Yeah. And then when I landed, I, there was a text from Roy saying, Hey, you, you're in LA. I saw you posted LAX to JFK to LAX. And I said, yeah. He said, did you bring your guitar with you? I said, yeah. He <laughs> said, uh, why don't you come over tomorrow and, and let's jam? And I said, I would love to do that. So I just went over to his house and in his backyard, he has, you know, like this ad addendum little building in the back, behind his house in his backyard, which is his studio. And that's where Stone Sour re re rehearses and records and whoever else Roy is playing with. So we just went back there and plugged in and spent the afternoon teaching him uh, one of my songs or two of my songs. And, you know, like that's the way I play music. I, don't, I would never go in and play, you know, a whole lot of love with, with Roy Mayorga. I would, just, well, you know, we would just go and jam and that's what we did and, and, uh, Within an hour or two, we worked up uh, one of my songs enough to play from beginning to end, and we and he just looks at me and goes, "Hey, you you want to lay it down, track it?" And I and I was like, "What?" And he goes, "Yeah, everything is mic'd. Uh, all my drums are mic'd. You're going into the board right now. All I have to do is press record." I said, "That's great. Let's do it." And he pressed record, and we played it once or twice, and I think we might have even picked the first take. And uh, he plays it back through the speakers, and I just sounded incredible. You know, that's where they do the Stone Sour recording. So, and you know, and he said to me, "He goes, you play bass, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Uh, that's uh Johnny Chow's bass over there. You want to plug it in and record bass track?" I was like, "Sure." And we just recorded the bass track right there on the spot. Then he goes, "Do you want to do some more guitar tracks?" And I said, "Yeah." We tracked. We we did a you know a couple of layers of guitar harmonies and stuff, and. Uh, and then he played it back through the speaker. He did a quick little rough mix and he played it back through the speakers. And I, I just looked at him. I was like, I was astonished. He, he goes, why? I said, I said, I don't know. I just kind of been out of the game for so long. And I've been playing with people that, you know, aren't as, you know, motivated as you to like spend an afternoon. And I, all of a sudden I'm like sitting here listening to an album quality song of something I wrote, you know, in my leisure time with your great drumming on it. 
And then like while I'm talking, he's like messing around with the board. He's like, he's not really paying attention to me. And then all of a sudden he pops out this thumb drive and he hands it to me. And I go, what's this? He goes, oh, it's the Pro Tools session. And I was like, what, you're just gonna give it to me? And he goes, of course. And I took that session home and I threw it in my desk drawer and it sat there for five years. Jeez. You know, because I was, you know, I went right into a movie and then I went right into another television show and I was trying to get things together with other musicians. And I was playing with this drummer, Cobbs, the guy who plays on, on the rest of the record. And I just didn't feel right, like having a track with Roy on it if I'm playing with Cobbs. So I tried to teach the song to Cobbs, but he, he, you know, like people embrace things that they like. He just didn't like it. Mm. So we never played it together. And then the pandemic happened and he, and he, you know, he had all these family obligations and Cobbs oh, ended up moving down south and kind of disappeared out of the picture. And then I released Chaos Magic. And that was the first time I heard from Cobbs in a long time. He wrote me, he's like, so I came in, I saw the video and it's fucking awesome. And the song sounds great, man. I really kind of wish I had realized how great what we were doing was when we were playing together. Cause we kind of like butt heads a lot and we ended on a very bad note. Mm. But, you know, even though we were butting heads, I still like, you know, I have loyalty. I just didn't want to like, bust out this track with Roy. Sure. But the album, like I said, I put out Chaos Magic and I kind of felt like my identity had come back musically. And I started reaching out and trying to find all these tracks that I that I'd recorded over the years. And one of them was like the very last, I, I had almost the whole album done. I was going to put it out as an EP. It was going to be just three songs. And then I just pulled that thumb drive out of my desk and I took it down to the studio. I plugged it in to my, and I said to my engineer, I was like, this is a track I recorded a couple of years ago. You know, I don't know how good it is or if it's as good as the rest of these songs, but like, let's listen to it. And he played it back through the speakers and he was like, wow, this is fucking great. And I said, okay, I just feel like it needs an intro and an outro and, and some additional stuff. But we didn't have to re-record any of the bass or the guitar or the rhythm guitars. The way it is on the record is exactly like that afternoon me and Roy recorded it. But then I brought my piano teacher in. Dear, that's how I learned how to play piano is just transposing my music to piano. And then Dear would teach me how to play it, but not only teach me how to play it, he would explain to me what I did musically. He says, you know, you're obviously a sophisticated songwriter, but you don't know what you're doing. Like, or at least you couldn't put it into words. So I'm going to put into words what you do. And he explained that I use a lot of traditional uh, songwriting techniques, but I, but I wasn't even aware that I did it. And he's like, here, you do this, you did this in that song, and you did the same thing in this song, and you use D minor a lot. And, you know, he explained it to me on that kind of level. But what I ended up getting was hearing a lot of these melodies that I'd written on the guitar, on the piano. And as soon as I heard them, I was like, wow, this is, a, this is something else. And I'd already wanted, you know, to... Before I started taking piano lessons, I had started writing things on the piano and I made little video demos of my songs. That's how I showed them to people, how I wrote them. I just set up video cameras and then I edit all the songs together. That's actually how I arrange music is with video. And uh, I would make these, I made a couple of videos with like these piano intros and stuff. So I'd kind of like laid this framework of how I wanted to do it, but I, my skill level on the piano wasn't that great. And I had written the motif, the piano motif for the ending of City Kids. I just sat down, the first time I took a lesson with Dirk, I sat down and went, down, 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 the way the, that piano motif starts. And he looked at me, he goes, oh, is that Thelonious Monk? I said, no, it's just something I wrote. He goes, oh, the chords you use, they're very strange, they're like very jazzy. He goes, you don't even know how to play piano. Like, that's, that's the only thing you know how to play, right? And I said, yeah. I said, I just wrote that one thing. And he goes, it's very Thelonious Monk. And I said, well, I'd like to turn this into an outro and have it be the outro of the song. And he goes, okay, let's explore it. And he goes, you're implying this and you're doing that and you're doing that. And this one chord you're doing, it really implies all this. And he would play all over the piano. And I was like, wow, that's really great. I said, I, maybe I was implying that, but uh, I, I can't play it like that. What could I do to get you to come into the recording studio with me? And then uh, a couple of days later, we went in the studio and we recorded that whole outro thing to the city kids. And then once that was done, I said, you know, I was, I, I always envision like this kind of like raindrop effect over the verse of, of, of fear of you mirror. It's like down, 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 down. It's like this really kind of thing. And I just imagine like, just, just the way the, the, 
the thing makes you create your hands do this like every time you're you know on the beat that these like kind of like raindrop sound would happen and uh so deer started hitting these notes like dun, ding, just like these kind of notes on all the beats that i told him to do it and then we would ex i would say yeah that doesn't sound dark enough and then he would do you know and then i pick up the guitar and we just and the next thing you know we had all these piano parts on there when i listen to the album now i'm pretty astonished because it was built like like literally like when you're putting down the puzzle pieces you don't know what the picture is going to look like yeah you kind of have to find it and that's very much the way i write songs i you know i try to create a skeleton and then i dress it up and then i change things around or at least i'm able to do that now when you're in a band it's, it's much more difficult to uh to make changes people get very attached to, to things the way they are but when you're alone you can be whimsical and change things constantly so when i when it's funny when i look at the song titles on here it's like every song title has a story and it, and it takes place over years like when i you know I, I when i look at uh fear view mirror the title fear view mirror on here and just think of that afternoon with roy just playing music because we love it and and i said when i said to him that day i was like you know uh, I said i can't believe this this recording we just made this recording this like this could be put out and I, and I said i've been jamming with people left and right for the past seven years and i just and i haven't really accomplished anything i feel like they're all pulling me in different directions to do things to do things anything but like what i do mm -hmm. and here we are you know we just you just sat down and you listened to what i played and we recorded it and and it's great and he just kind of like looks back into me and he goes you're just not playing with people on your level, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. And that was that was kind of like a, a revelation, you know, coming from him because he's a you know, he's a true pro. He goes from like ministry to stone sour to this, you know. He's the guy that people go to. And uh for him to put it in that kind of context, because that's the world he lives in. I was kind of trying to live in a world where like I pulled unknown people out to try to see what I could pull out of them and treat them you know, kind of like uh, like the people that I've played with my whole life. But it's a little bit more difficult to do that than I thought because a lot of people want to have, they want to feel like they are part of the direction, but they don't have a direction. Mm -hmm. I found myself in that situation. And it's not, it's not to blame them because I really catered to them because I wanted them to be happy. I'm kind of a team player, oddly enough, to say that I just made an album basically by myself and then say I'm a team player. I like the idea of being in a band. But uh, I just haven't had uh, a band situation that I ever liked. See, look, man, you fly out to L.A. and catch lightning in a bottle with Roy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like one of those things meant to be. Yeah, no, uh, you know, and it, and I and I had that same kind of I had that same kind of magic with 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 Cobbs. It definitely took a lot longer, and I had to like really pull it out of him because, like, you know, everybody has their own ambitions. Cobb had the ambition; he wanted to be in a death metal band. I mean, that's really all he wanted. And he developed this like masterful playing for playing that kind of music, that like niche music. You have to be kind of like an athlete to play that music. Mm -hmm. and he developed this tech, but he also liked hardcore music. I actually found him because he put out an ad on Craigslist saying, I'm a drummer. I like this, 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 and the Chromags. So I responded to his ad. And then I showed up to his studio and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but ultimately he, you know despite all the jamming we did he really just wanted to fill the room up with people to play with because he wanted to feel like he was in a band and i kept saying well i'll i'll, I'll bring people in as soon as we you know as we find good people but he didn't he just wanted to play with anybody so he was always trying to invite just anybody and that was that would have been exhausting i, I just didn't feel like i could have accomplished anything that way oh yeah he told me he's like i just want to be in a death metal band so we just kind of like shook hands and and parted ways but before he did that i asked him to do me a favor i said please you know i've been jamming in here for two years and we really haven't done anything i said i'd really 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 like to finish this one song I, i'll record it to a click because it had an astronomically long arrangement it was you know chaos magic and it and it's very difficult to learn and I said, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to trouble you to learn it, but I'll track the whole thing out so you can see exactly how the arrangement is and you can play to it. But, but I want you to play to it 
the way I ask you to play, like almost like a work for hire. And we did that. We spent about three days doing it. And, uh, and I got the song exactly the way I wanted it. But by the end of that, by the, by the time we were finished, he was so aggravated with me that he threw me out of his studio. And I didn't speak to him for four years. Oh, wow. But he gave me the session <laughs> on the thumb drive. Jeez. And, uh, and I put it out. And, uh, and then that's when he, like I said, he called me up and he was like, oh, man, I heard, I heard the song. Man, he goes, that song is fucking great. And now we're playing together again. So, you know, it's all good. People, you know, everybody's got their ups and downs and they have their priorities in life. He's got family. He's got a job. He lives out in North Dakota. The, the, the most important thing to me is that me and him made that song. You know, yeah. we completed it. You know, I don't know if anybody could have played the drums the way he played on that. But, you know, it, even if even if I had walked away with that song with a click and just got somebody else to do it, I, I would have certainly would have done that. But I'm gl really glad he did it. And I feel connected to him because of that. The same way I feel connected in gratitude to Roy for that, for him doing that one. I'm sure. Let me see. There's another drummer who plays on the song Ghosts of New York, which is the second half of City Kids. It's another drummer. He's just a friend of mine. And uh, he was about to move to California. And I said, I said, when are you moving? He goes, in two weeks. I said, okay, let's go somewhere and rehearse for a week. And then let's go into the studio and record the song. And we did. And that song sat in a hard drive for four or five years. Jeez, at and, least you made up with him, man. That's that's the cool part because having yeah. that baggage of going around, well, I've got this song, but I, you know, such and such helped me out on it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, should I put it out or not? Which I know it's your song, but still, it's still that little itch about I need to make up this 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 thing right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, like you know, I don't, I don't, I don't blame Cobbs for having his own ambitions. I mean, everybody should. I, I've learned long, long ago that you don't you don't try to bend people to your will you just yeah. find people who are who feel like they're on the same mission and team up with those like chuck like you know chuck is the most spectacular singular voice on guitar but he also just happens to be a really really awesome person and uh my experience with him recording the these songs is like i've never had that you know i never had that in a long-term kind of situation i had it obviously when i went to roy's house that day and uh, but my experience with, with Chuck is just spectacular. I mean, he's way more talented than anybody I know on the guitar personally. And uh, the fact that I can get him to play on my record is awesome. And we're going to do this tour together. It's great. You know, it's, it's great to play with people you like. Yeah. And, and I was going to mention that for Chaos Magic, that features hardcore legend Chuck Linehan. And you you've always felt that he he was like a secret weapon. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like. Describe what you mean by as a secret weapon for people. Well, you know, Chuck plays in a lot of bands. He play, you know, he plays in Christian uh, Death, and he plays in uh, in Carnivore AD, and, and you know, he was in the Crumb Suckers. You know, a lot of people know know him, and they know him as a spectacular player in all those contexts. But I know something about Chuck that they don't know. I've seen what like Chuck does when he's by himself. You know, when he when he when he makes something on his own, and uh, you know, he used to have this little four track machine and. He used to like make these guitar solos like, you know, Eddie Van Halen stuff, but with like six or seven harmonies. And it would just be like this orchestrated, crazy, not, you know, what I thought was astronomical skill, but I could never imagine in a song context. So I'd always look at him and be like, what the hell are you going to do with that? You can't do, put that in a song. But I always had this in my head. And uh, when Chaos Magic was done and I felt like it was complete, I just, something just kept tugging at my brain. Like, you know, I know Chuck Lanahan. I should call him up, and I and I sent him the the song, and, and he ended up playing a solo on it. He sent it to me, and it just it was just a good solo. It was just a good solo. I was like, oh, that's a good solo, but I'm not going to put it on the record. He goes, why not? I said, I don't know. That's not what I expected. He goes, what did you expect? I said, well, you remember when you used to play all those crazy solos on your four track, where there was like seven harmonies, and like I used to roll my eyes at you and laugh. He goes, yeah. I feel that that's what I want you to do. And he goes, oh, okay. And then like two days later, he sent me the solo that is on the record. And it was better than I ever, ever could have imagined. It had all those virtuosity uh, attributes, but it was incredibly melodic. And it had, uh, and there was a little journey that was taking, taking place in that, you know, four bars or whatever it was. You know, it was a sophisticated version of that, 
that child, uh, that teenage, I don't, I, I can't even put a word on it, what he was doing, but then it was just kind of like, he was flexing, you know, when he was a teenager, it was like, he's like, I have this, I have this, I need, people need to hear this, I'm going to make this. And he had no place to put it. And then all these years later, even though I feel Chuck has distinguished himself, he's known as probably the best lead guitar player on the hardcore scene. I knew that there was something else that nobody knew about. And I, and, and that's why I think of Chuck as the secret weapon because he was like my smart, my smart bomb on the defender machine. You know, the last second, like I hit the smart bomb and Chuck Glenahan suddenly plays on chaos magic. And like, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> this was something, man, that kind of took me by surprise. You got to video typo negatives, black number one and Onyx slam. So I want to talk about this just a little bit. How important is it for a band, especially for you coming out now, to have an intimate video to sell what you're trying to put out, that product? Especially like Typo Negative. I mean, my God, that that video just knocks you out. I don't care who you are. If you sit and watch that video, I mean, if that don't hit you hard in the face and be like, whoa, I don't know what will. Well, especially back then, it was important. You know, I directed the black number one video I, I directed onyx slam onyx slam was the longest number one mtv video ever but my I, had, I kind of had a philosophy about how music videos should be back then and and primarily it was band identification like if you could watch a video from beginning to end and not recognize the the, the members of the band walking down the street if you saw them 10 minutes later then the video was a failure and I would see tons of videos like that. I see tons of videos like that on YouTube now where like the entire screen is shaking and like there's lights flashing and flares. And, and you, at the end of the video, you can't tell what anybody looks like. Yeah. And, and that's also a problem with a lot of, a lot of uh, artists. Like artists feel like they're only successful if they look like another artist that's successful or they sound like another artist that's successful. And back when I was directing videos, a lot of the artists would be, I want the video to look like Buster Rhymes' video. I want the video to look like this. And I would say, you know, I don't really do that. I look at you and uh, I, I try to accentuate the attributes of you that appeal to me. And that was how I sold Pete on doing a video for Typo Negative was I said, I, I actually said to Pete, I said, I'm begging you to allow me to show the world what I see when I look at you. Because he, he, when we first started talking about the video, you know, out of respect, I, I sat down with him and Josh and I said, you know, I want to know what you want. I, you know, what are your ideas? Give. And they didn't have any ideas, which was really pretty astonishing to me. I, I just thought Pete, you know, because he's such a musical intellectual, you know, he, he's such a thoughtful uh, composer. I just thought that he would have ideas for the video, but he didn't. And neither did Josh. So I said, and, and then, but, but he capped it off by saying, but I know I want it to be funny. And I said, well, Pete, you know, I don't think you're funny. I mean, you are funny. He's a very funny guy. I said, but I don't, when I think of your music, it, it's not funny. To me, it's dead serious. And, and that's when I said, this. I said, I'm begging you. I know how I want to do this video. And I am begging you to allow me to show people what, what I see when I see you. And this, this didn't begin with Black Number One. Me and Pete had talked about doing a video for the previous album, um, Slow, Deep, and Hard. But the, there was just no money for it. The label wasn't interested in it. I just wanted to like lay the groundwork with Pete because one of the things was all the songs were really long on that album. So I went and, and met with Josh and Pete back then. It wasn't even like an official meeting. It's like, it's funny how like the enthusiasm of youth and creativity is like Roy just calling me up and saying, let's go you know, come over to my house and turns into recording. I, you know, we were just doing everything we could to move forward creatively. So we would have meetings, you know? So me and Josh and Pete meet up and I, and cause I had this idea and, and they were like, what's the idea? You know, when you make a music video, it doesn't really represent the album. It's one song from the album. So if you're rationalizing this idea that the music video is totally representing the band, it doesn't. So if, if that is the case, then what's, what, what would be wrong with assembling a medley of the songs on the record 
in a shorter form. And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? I said, I was listening to the album and you have in this one song, you have this spectacular chorus, but the rest of the song is like 20 minutes long. And then this other song, you have this great verse. If we could take that from this song and put it to, and, and tack this other part of the end, it would only be four minutes long. It'd be a single length. And you don't have any songs that are single lengths. And then we could pitch that to the label to do a video for it. And Josh was like, who the fuck do you think you are? You can kind of come in here and arrange our music. And, and he, he just got enraged. But Pete is standing right next to him going. <laughs> like he's doing the math in his head. And he goes, hmm. Well, they are complementary keys and they would go together. That actually makes a lot of sense. And Josh looks at him and goes, are you, are you honestly considering this? And I said, listen, Josh, man, I'm not, I'm not butchering your music. I'm just presenting an idea. Like we, we haven't even talked to the label. I just thought, you know, the way the music works, you could actually arrange a song. He's like, and, and you could see what it is. Is in typo negative. Pete arranges and writes all the music. And he doesn't have, he didn't have a voice in that. And here was an outsider presenting an idea for an arrangement that Pete was accepting. Yeah. And, and that really ruffled his feathers. And unfortunately that created a rift between me and Josh that would never close. You know, we were friends, we're friend, well, not I wouldn't say friends, but we were very friendly before that. I'd recorded demos in his house and, you know, he was just another guy on the scene that I liked and respected. And, uh, but that was kind of the end of that. So even by the time we ended up doing the typo negative video, there was a certain uh, animosity. And by the time we finished the black number one video, it was just, uh, it had reached like full flowering, like hatred. <laughs> but the, the point of that whole story, at least for me is, I really, really just look at the artists, especially back then, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any vast film knowledge. I would literally just listen to a song and look at the people until an idea struck me. And when I was listening to Black Number One, I, I, I'd just been, I just finished the book, Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. And they hadn't made a movie yet. So I didn't have like those terrible visions of Tom Cruise and that horrible movie. But that book is, 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 a, is a great book. It's beautifully written. And the opening of the book is act literally an interview with a vampire. It's like this young guy who wants to be a writer. So he finds, he's trying to find things to write about. And he finds this guy who claims to be a vampire and wants to talk, tell the story of his life. So of course it's like young college student goes to meet this guy. And to him, it's just an exercise in writing, you know, <laughs> just like me going to Roy's house and jamming. And, uh, and he sits down with this vampire and they're sitting at this table and there's just like a light bulb above the table you know, bare light bulb. And the vampire's like leaning back in the dark, but like much more in the dark and you couldn't see him. Yeah. But in the book, the way Anne Wright describes it is that from time to time, as he was, you know, getting uh, excited about the story, he would put his hands on the table and lean into the shaft of light. And at one point in the story, when the writer, the kid doing the interview, the uh, Lestat leans into the light and the right the kid actually gets his first real look at Lestat and she describes this primal feeling that he got like the way the way you feel when you see a tiger in the jungle or a bear you know where your your instincts kick in and you get you know the hair on the back of your neck sticks up and you just have this primal fear of, of fight or flight and uh and I just remember that the description was so powerful and this idea of him his face just like getting cut by the light and I explained all that to Pete and Josh. And I said, and I want, that's how I want to shoot the verses. And they were, they were like, it sounds, it sounds great. And that's, and that's what I ended up doing, but it was a singular vision that I had for Pete um, based on listening to the song and reading this book. And the same thing with Onyx Slam, you know, I got sent this tape and I was sent a picture of the guys in Onyx and I just sat there and listened to it and listened to it and listened to it. And I remember just coming up with this phrase which was like being on LSD in a riot. And I wrote that down on a piece of paper and that was the first line of the treatment. 
And apparently Sticky Finger said to me, went later on, he goes, he goes, oh, you had me on the first line, being on LSD in a riot. And then I just did my best to, you know, what you do is when you write a treatment for a music video or a story or a song or anything like that, you go big. You, you put everything you, you have on the paper and then you strip away. You know, it could be based on budget or, you know, it's mostly about budget. You know, you can come up with big ideas, but if you can't pay for it. So I just put, I just went big on the page with Onyx Slam. And uh, that video just, you know, it defined Onyx. To this day, if anybody thinks of Onyx, they think of Onyx Slam. To oh, yeah. this day, anybody yep. thinks about typo negative, they think about black number one. Black number one. Yep. That's Those exactly people, right. they define the, And when you think of biohazard, what video do you Well, most people say pu punishment. And I directed that too. And, I, and, and with that one, I remember when I wrote the treatment, I wrote the first line of the treatment was biohazard is not a band. They are a movement. Mm. And, and Bobby the handball told me that that was the thing. Hey, Bobby, when we were making the video, he would call me up on the days we weren't shooting. He'd be like, Paris, do me a favor. Read the treatment to me over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I would read it to him. And he goes, he goes, man, that is so inspiring. I'm so glad you see us like that. And that was before I even shot the video. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. my, 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 whole, my, my whole philosophy for making those videos was to show people what I see when I see the band. And when I saw Biohazard, I didn't see a band. I saw a movement. I saw all their fans and all of them in the same place at the same time, all the time. And they were like, yes, we love that. We love that. And, you know, Shades of Grey and Punishment are definitive videos for them. Tycho Negative Black Number One is a definitive video. And when I found myself making a video for myself, you know, I know myself, obviously, but I had, a, I had to figure out a way to present myself to other people um, in, a, in, a, in a musical context. It's weird to have to separate yourself, but I just did for myself what I used to do for artists. And I, you know, I think I made the best videos I've ever made in my life when I made Chaos Magic and uh, City Kids back to back. You know, you also don't get the kind of leisure, again, the way I said I have with my songwriters songwriting now, to go on a whim, you know, I just do whatever I feel like doing. I would wake up in the morning and go, hmm, what if I was on the bridge and there were like eight of me on the bridge, sp sprawled out like over like a hundred feet. So by the time I'm way in the back, I'm a teeny me and then in the front on the, and then I'll have some, I'll, then I'll stand like really in tight in the foreground and be out of focus. And then I'll be back there. And I just shot it all in the, like I'd go out and do one shot all night long. I would spend five hours doing one shot, but then I would layer myself you know eight ten fifteen times and it was it took an astronomically long amount of time another thing people you know i tell them and they go oh yeah how did i not notice that but in almost every shot in the chaos magic video there's a subway train going by in the background whether it's a shot of my hand a close-up my hand playing there's a train going by if it's a close-up on my face there's a train going by if it's my sneakers because there's a lot of shots on my sneakers there's a shot of my, there's a train going by so that mean that meant I had to wait for the train to come to roll the camera. Wow. And the train came every 30 minutes. And the train going by took 25 seconds. We timed it. So I would get a 25 second take every 30 minutes for five hours. So I, you know, that's not a lot. So I would have that's why I had to return to the bridge 22 nights. And I had to know exactly what I was shooting. Like I would frame it up. I would light myself perfectly, you know, like you would, like you'd write it, light an actor in a movie, you know, make sure I got a ping of light in my eye and the edge light on my, this, you know, on my cheekbone, you know, we know how to light people, you know, that's what we do. So I had everything, I would spend like an hour lighting a shot that I would shoot over and over all night for 25 seconds. And again, you know, like people say to me, oh my God, that, 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 I don't, I don't understand how you could do all that. I said, well, I'm doing it for myself. I spent up this astronomical, amount of time assembling this puzzle that I'm so proud of when I make the music video, I, I've got to make it at least the best I can. And, sure. and seeing those trains going by in the background is just beautiful visual. It, you know, it's, you know, there, there's always been something about trains that intrigue people, but the movement and the light passing behind, you know, every image it's, it's, it, 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 it creates a cohesion from the video. I mean, for six, almost seven minutes, this this uh, eternal train passing in the background is really uh, 
what I was trying to achieve. So yeah, a music video is a powerful, powerful tool that lasts forever. You know, I'm not going to be this me for the rest of my life. So I want to capture it, the time that I made this music and who I was at the time represented in some kind of, you know, otherworldly, mystical, theatrical, cinematic way. You know, with the, the way I used to love watching videos on MTV in the 90s and the 80s, you know, those awesome David Fincher, you know, videos he made, you know, and the Michael Jackson, these things were like these little slices of life you remember forever. And you look back and, you know, oh, what wasn't Michael Jackson awesome back then? You know, that's what you want to do with a music video. It's, it's almost, it's just as important as the record, I think. I, I love looking at videos. I, I go on YouTube. I go on YouTube and look at old videos and look at new videos, new bands and new turnstile videos. I, I guess they're not really new from last year. They're really great. So yeah, I'm you know, and I'm in the middle of making a, a video for Skateboard Fight. Every song on the album will have a video. If it, if it takes me five years to do it, I'll do it because I'm not on a time schedule. I I can do. I'm doing it because I I love it. And the only reason I'm so late at delivering the Skateboard Fight video is that I broke my toe about three, three, four months ago. And, and it's only just now that I can move around, but I was just in the midst of shooting it when I broke my toe. You, you're amazed how debilitating uh, uh, or how much you need a toe. <laughs> That's crazy. But now, but, I, but I've been editing, I edited a bunch of the footage that I shot. So I'm, I'm just gonna spend the next couple of weeks uh, shooting the rest of it and I'll, and I'll release the video for Skateboard Fight just on the cusp of us going on tour in July. What led the track City Kids to be that first song to go out for you for this album? What was it about that said, yeah, let's just put this out first? Was it just because it was done first, or what was it about it? Well, I, I put out Chaos Magic first. Oh, Chaos Magic, okay. Well, I, so I, put, I put out Chaos Magic almost two years before the album actually was completed and, and manufactured. Uh, it didn't have the guitar solo with Chuck Lenahan. Um, so the, the, the video for Chaos Magic that I put out recently, it was. I basically redid it, like I did a redux. I, I went back on the bridge, you know, two years later with Chuck, and I shot him basically in the same circumstance, trains going by, you know, that the nighttime look. And then I took all that footage and I re-edited the video. I added some new video, no, new footage all throughout the video. I recolor corrected it to be even more vibrant than it was before. I tightened it up. I did the thing, I changed the things that maybe rubbed me the wrong way. And then I re-released that as the first single for the album, and then I uh, and and then I followed that up with with City Kids. There was no, you know, there's really no, there was no rhyme or reason for it. It's just that it, Chaos Magic was completed first, and then the next song that I had completed was City Kids, so that became the second video. And then once City Kids was out, that was really when I went into the studio with all those puzzle pieces I talked about, and I played some the basic tracks to then my my editor because a lot of them were just made as demos i just wanted to hear them so i played him uh best destiny i was like do you think this is salvageable do you think we could get enough out of the drums to make this worthwhile and we started mixing it and we started you know replacing the snare drums replacing the bass drums but the performance was the same and then i was like okay how about the bass he goes well you recorded it through a sans amp which is basically direct he goes, so let's just work with that. And we spent an entire day getting the bass to sound great. We got the bass to sound spectacular. The Sans amp is a, is a great tool. And then we listened to all the guitar tracks. And even though they were, you know, not perfect the way you would normally approach making a record, when you when you make a record, the goal is to make is to play the play everything perfectly. You know, first the drums have to be perfect. They have to a foundation that's perfect. And then you build it bass perfect, guitar perfect, and and, and so on. But none of it was really perfect. And that was something that I was kind of afraid of. But there's something about the cumulative effect of all the give and take and waviness and the imperfections of it worked well. So we didn't change it and we just went with it. And, and so even though I didn't know that song we'd make it on the record, we just started working on it. And then we just started working on, on uh, Fear of You Mirror and we just started working on Skateboard Fight. And we did it in increments, you know, like over time. You know, it, it wasn't, again, there wasn't the goal. I, I thought I was going to put out an EP with just Chaos, Magic, and City Kids, but as these other songs started to take shape and they were just as good as the other songs, uh, that's when I started to get the vision for the album. Hey, I won a lottery. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was telling me that I had you <laughs> a little bit too late. 
Was there a track for this album that totally ended up sounding different than what it, than what it was intended to? Basically, the skeleton of the songs are you couldn't really disguise them in any way. But a song like Best Destiny took a different shape because of whimsy. You know, um, the, the whimsy of taking p- uh, my piano lessons and hearing my music played in a different way. And uh, we had come up with all these uh, piano parts for, for City Kids, so I knew it was going to work. I didn't bother doing it on revisiting Chaos Magic. I felt that was uh, complete, but we ended up doing piano on the other songs. But, but on Best Destiny, there was this piano outro, which was this little uh, piano articulated version of the chorus in the song which we had already decided to place at the end of the song, uh, but as a piano part. And, uh, and we had recorded that already, but then we were going to record the choruses, which is the same part, but I wanted to play it on a church organ. You know, I'm a big fan of yes. And I just love that sound of a church organ. And I, I just thought it would make the chorus sing a little bit better. So we were getting the sound and I said to him at first, I was like, oh, you know, give me an organ sound. So he immediately made it sound like John Lord from Deep Purple. Dirk is a jazz guy and he, and he definitely understands a certain amount of rock music, you know, peripherally, but he's not really like a heavy music fan. So I, it, it's really, you really got to dig things out of him. And I was like, no, 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 not like a John Lord organ. I want like a church organ. I want it to sound like choral, like singing like a church. So he gets the sound and... I said, just play the play the outro on that. And he goes, yeah, it, it, it won't really sound right because, you know, all these sounds, they kind of blend together. It's a very ethereal sound. Yeah, I like that. You know, like John Paul Jones from the Led Zeppelin. He's like, who? <laughs> I was like, you know, the guy from Led Zeppelin, the bass player plays piano. And he, and he just started to play the outro on the organ, demonstrating to me how it wouldn't work on the organ because – it's um, all the notes kind of like wash over each other and it's not really as articulate as it, it was on the end. And he started playing it and I immediately was like, that sounds just like John, like uh, John Paul Jones is playing. I mean, it, this is like, if I hired a studio musician and said, play something that sounds like John Paul Jones, they would play this. And he goes, oh, and I said, don't take your hands off the keys. And I turned to Vin, I was like, roll a take. And he goes, roll a take of what? I said, whatever he plays, I said, play the outro, play it like this, show me how it doesn't work. And we recorded it. And he just ended it with this big, you know, like, like a church organ thing would be done. And then I was like, don't, 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 don't take your hands off the key. All right. And then I turned to Vin and I said, now take this piece and put it at the beginning of, of, of best destiny. He goes, but there's a guitar thing at the beginning. I was like, delete it. Just like, chop it, delete it, put this right there. And uh, we we played it and like, and then he does his big like, dun, 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 and then the drums go, and it goes right into the song. And both Derek and Vin looked at me and they were like, that's awesome. And it, you know, and it wasn't something I thought about. I just, it was whimsy. You know, it was just believing that you know what you like. And, and, and knowing what you like is, Shouldn't be hard, but yeah. a lot of people have a hard time trans- trusting their sensibilities, and I think that's the most important about thing about being an artist. The thing, a thing that I learned from Francis Ford Coppola, watching the film uh, *The Hearts of Darkness*. It's the uh, making of *Apocalypse Now*. I watched this guy, you know, who had invested all his own money, millions and millions, fifty million, hundred million dollars, whatever it was, making a movie without a script with an egomaniacal uh, lead actor who doesn't want to cooperate and the other actor drinking himself to death and getting a heart attack. And Francis Ford Coppola sitting at his typewriter night after night, writing the script all night long and then shooting all day and then writing all night long and just, and not having an ending. And then his wife coming up and saying, oh, I saw this ritual in the other town. You should come see it. It's like where they sacrifice a cow. And it's really kind of like, gory but beautiful somehow and francis coppola went and watched it and he had the end of his movie i mean if you've ever seen the end of apocalypse now it's this like sacrificing of the of kurtz and sacrificing of the cow is a parallel edit a technique he used in the godfather you know there was the assassination of mo green and the rest of the heads of the five family with the the baptism scene you know like that parallel editing thing became a uh, 
uh, Francis Ford Coppola's staple, but he did it really beautifully at the end of Apocalypse Now with the sacrifice of the cow and, and the killing of Kurtz. But the takeaway I had was, you know, he just grabbed the organ part and cut off the piano intro and put it on there. And, you know, that's what I did. I just, I just imitated Francis Ford Coppola by believing that I knew what I liked. I know these are your babies. I know you've had these for years and I know that, you know, this is like picking your favorite house or favorite car or whatever, but uh, any tracks standing out more to you, Paris, than any right now on this album, if you could pick one possibly. Chaos Magic. And, it, and it's for a variety of reasons because it was the first one. It was the first complete one that I could actually look at after not being active in music for, you know, decades. And everybody kind of, you know, hanging whatever musical accomplishments I had ever had in my past life on what I did with uh, in a group context. And when I heard Chaos Magic, like I said, driving around in my car, it was very freeing because um, it released me from uh, any anticipation of the idea that I couldn't deliver what I had delivered in the past outside of a band context. If anything, I felt like Chaos Magic was an entire uh, Chrome Mags album in one song. It was, you know, there was more music involved in that in that seven minutes than there usually is on an entire album. And, and, it, and it's arranged in a very cinematic storyline way with uh, a, a very definitive beginning, uh, a, a, you know, a, a middle and, and conflict and a res resolution and a catharsis. It's a complete musical story. And that realization, I mean, I always knew I could do it. I mean, it says clearly on Age of Coral, all songs written by Paris Mayhew and Holly Flanagan. I always knew that I did it before, but I just let that kind of passion lay dormant for a lot of years because I channeled my creativity into the film business. And not that I really had any doubts, but uh, when you don't do something for a long time, you just kind of like wonder. Also, you just wonder if the music that you make is going to be relevant again. Yeah. Yeah. So many, so many musicians, they make something and then five years goes by and then you're still in Temple Pilots, you know? That's true. I mean, I'm not, that's not a distance on Temple Pilots, but like they were part of that grunge era and they'll, they'll be tied to that forever. And I was part of the Chromex and they were tied of that you know, part of that New York hardcore uh, era. And uh, I just wondered if if I approached music the same way I approached it back then, would it just come off as uh, retro, you know, like listening to Tears for Fears kind of sounding like the Beatles, you know, or something like that. And uh, what I discovered is that, you know, the same way I, I approach basically anything, I just go with what I like. And if it makes me happy as a fan, I mean, because literally for five years, I didn't listen to music. All I did was listen to these demos over and over and over and like tried to figure out what to do them, played guitar and did recordings and mixed and all that kind of stuff. You know, I just lived with it as a fan. And if if I could listen to Chaos Magic in my car 150 times and not get tired of it, I knew it was okay. Yeah. So so Chaos Magic to me was the was a was kind of a, a hinge for me to open this door to let the other songs out. Because then I just was able to dive into these songs with the same fervor and the same belief that I knew what I liked. And that if I just kept pushing and accentuating all the things that I liked, that somebody else would like it. And then the next thing you know, that an entire album was made. And I, and I, when I, I, do, I do pick Chaos Magic to answer your question, but I also feel that you could take any song off this record to have it represent this record. Sure. For the cro fans that listen to this album, are they going to get to experience a different sound than accustomed to? No, I think it'll sound, I think it'll sound very familiar. Okay. It'll just way much more. I mean, and I'm just, I'm quoting what people have said to me. You know, they, they, they say like immediately when I heard Chaos Magic, I was like, oh, <laughs> now I get it. Now I understand why the last two cro albums don't sound like the cro -Mags. There's something missing songwriter but um but then on top of it i've basically layered on top of it all the other things that i love in music i love yes i love rush 
I love, you know, um, King Diamond. You know, I, when I look at this record, I hear King Diamond at the end of City Kids when I, when when that like kind of like music box piano comes in during. And then the keyboard click, clicks in. You know, I, there's no doubt in my mind that if I did not know and love King Diamond, that I wouldn't have made that part of the song. You know, just like the outro to City Kids, the piano outro to City Kids, I modeled that after the song Ascending on the Black Crow's Amorica album. Because they have this like beautiful piano outro after this one song that kind of echoes the melody of the song. So I just basically took the melody that exists in the song during that Teen Diamond part and I expounded on it on the piano as best I could. And then when I heard Dirk play it way better than I did, that's when it happened. But but that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had the ambition to model that song's ending if I hadn't heard Ascending by the Black Crows. And then and there's there's a lot there's you know I could look at so many parts on here and uh, tell you the origin story of the imprint that I got, you know, because music marks us forever. The music we love, you know, I'll never forget how Rush Hemispheres made me feel or how Master of Puppets made me feel the, 20, the 26th time I heard it. Yeah. The, the impression it had on me was everything I thought music could be before I heard that album had changed. The, the, the song Master of Puppets, it, it became a model in my mind of a journey that music should be. And it reminded me a lot of the same exact journey you take when you listen to Yes, Close to the Edge, an entire side of music that is one song. I feel like, you know, I, I, I would imagine Metallica was influenced by that. But, you know, myself as, a, as an artist, I probably felt that taking a cue from Yes might be a little ambitious. But then you see a band like Metallica do it, and it, it suddenly changes the context. And then you walk away with this imprint in your mind of what music can be and should be. Yep. And all those imprints that I've had on me from Rush, yes, Van Halen, Turnstile in recent times, Pantera, Slipknot, you know, all these bands, you know, like when I listen to a band like Slipknot, you know, I know there's a certain bias against them because of the masks and the, and the shtick. But the first time I ever heard Slipknot was at a sound check at Roseland. My friend ran Roseland and I was walking by and he's like, hey, why don't you come in and watch this band uh, sound check? And there were these nine guys on stage, no makeup, none of the outfits, and they just started playing and my jaw dropped. They were, they were astonishing. They were so creative. They were so unusual. And a lot of people can say there's a lot of bands that sound like them. I, I've had people say, oh, if you like Slipknot, you'll like this. And then I listen to them, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. There's, I don't see any correlation between that band and this band. I actually don't see any correlation between them and any band, except for some stylistic things with Corn. But um, they're on a just on a artistic level. If you stood outside as an artist and looked in, the things that they achieve musically are, are astonishing. Astonishing, and if you can let go of the shtick, if that's the thing that is, if that's the obstacle that's that keeping you from loving this wealth of music that is their albums, then I don't understand it. But they've definitely changed the way I think music can be or should be, even though I haven't taken any musical cues from them. Like when you listen to this album, there's nothing of Slipknot on it, but I could easily see it happening down the road because they've made that imprint on me. And one day I'll pick up my guitar and maybe I'll play something that rings familiar to that imprint and then I'll, and I'll carry it with me. Same thing with the band, you know, I don't really see that with a band like uh, Turnstile so much because I feel like those guys, those guys and me, we share so many of the same imprints. I feel like when I listen to that Turnstile album, even though it doesn't sound like my record at all, I feel like I see how we both arrived at the same place. They don't hesitate with uh, taking cues from you know, you know, I, you know, I hear Rhodes piano on there and. And I don't think it stands out in any kind of odd way at all. No. And, and I and I hear even Beastie Boys on that album. It, you know, the vocal approach is very you know gratitude and uh, from the Beastie Boys and uh, Jane's Addiction and all those kinds of things. But I don't I don't think it sounds like that. But I can definitely see how 
listening to Check Your Head made an imprint on the singer's uh, brain and listening to uh, Eye Against Eye made an imprint on the guitar player. And, you know, like I said, I, I see the end product of their most recent album and I feel like we arrived at our albums coming from sim similar places, even though sure. they're completely different. I just understand uh, that they're fans of music. Turnstile is a breath of fresh air, man. I mean, I, it's like, I, it's I, so it's so cool to see young ones like that coming up and be like, you know, it's it's good metal, metal, whatever you want to call them. It's it's in good hands. <laughs> they, they remind me a lot of the second, first, second wave of, of hardcore music. You know, bands yeah. like Ed Kennedy's and true. Uh, you know, when when the Dead Kennedys, the Misfits, you know, Black Flag, Bad Brains, when you had like this this cluster of bands that didn't sound alike really at all. And the thing that distinguished them was that they were being creative kind of with the same skeleton, um, but they all had their own voice. So to me, I, I could easily see taking this Turnstile album and like taking it back in time to when Fresh Fruit and Rot Rotting Vegetables came out. And you know, walk among us, and and, uh, and and putting those and group sex by the circle jerks, and putting those four or five albums all side by side, and saying, "This is <laughs> this is hardcore of the moment." And so to me, it, the the new turnstile resembles hardcore that I remember from back then in that phase. I mean, obviously, it's it's you know live and well and bigger than ever now, but it's taken on a different form. And most of that, a lot of that form is kind of uniform as opposed to there being six top bands that all sound completely different. There's maybe 50 bands that are, are, uh, are uh, more uniform as opposed to being so one side of the spectrum or the other side of the spectrum. I guess that comes with, you know, things becoming defined, like the way metal music is. You don't yeah. hear a lot of... Um, you don't hear a lot of variety in terms of stylistic uh, um, polarization. It's just kind of like they're the middle ground. Like whereas you know, like I used to always say, you know, King Diamond, and Merciful Fate is over here, and Turnstiles over here, and Pantera's in the middle, and we're all related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will say this, and I've said this a million times, and hopefully one day I'll have them on here, at least one of them. But Master of Puppets saved my life when I really needed music the most, you know? I mean, it was my anthem. It was everything I needed to say. That album did for me. So it, it's it's beautiful how you can relate to an album. And it just... Takes you on a journey. Yeah. Maybe away from what you're, what's bothering you. Yeah. It was very a dark place at that time during my life. And... uh and I hope I know everybody has to go through it at one point, but I should have never let it get as bad as it did. I'll say that. You know what you're saying is is relevant because I, I, you're not alone. Yeah. You know there there's so many people who find themselves alone, and they find the light in music, and that is one of the most grateful things that I have as a music fan and as a person who's created music. I've had a thousand people tell me, oh, yeah, you know, I want to, you make me want to work out at the gym or, you know, 10,000 things like that. But peppered in there are people that come to me with similar sen sentiments that you have, and they thank me for, or they thank the music for playing a role in getting them through it to, you know, and hinting at the fact that they felt like there was no hope and the music gave them hope. And I, and all I can think of was what records made me feel that way and looking at them in the eye and saying, wow, are you te you're telling me that the music that I made in my mom's kitchen had that same effect, that same, um, that same uh, rescuing effect on you. That's the, the, the best I can ever hope for. And yeah. so when, when you say that, I, I hear, I, I feel your, your desire to, to retreat from it but I totally understand you and I've, and I've had the same experience with different music. So yeah, it, it made me want to feel it. And, it, it uh... and, and that's the thing that bonds that I think that's to a large extent what bonds fans of this kind of music. Yeah. It sure does. The, 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 
most of the time, most of the, the experiencing of, of records, we do alone. We sit in our basements or we sit in our room and we listen to these records in the dark over and over and over again until they are imprinted on us for the rest of our lives. And they take us away and they take us on a journey and hopefully they empower us. A lot of time, a lot of people feel the empowerment of this mu music. But the thing is, we're all listening to it at the same time, just yeah. in different basements all over the world. So when you tell me that story of you like being in that dark place, sitting in your basement, listening to Master Puppets, I was in my basement listening to, you know, whatever I was listening to at the time. So yeah. I told you, man, that's the power of music. That's wonderful. I love it. That's all we can hope and aspire to. And that's why I do my podcast, because I hope that there's some band that I have on here that inspires the person listening to go pick up their, their discography. And it does the same for them. That's all I ask for. We're all in it together. <laughs> I'm just going to throw this out here. You can, you can answer it or not, but... Could we possibly see down the road? Maybe. No. Okay. Okay. Fred, <laughs> oh, that's all I need to know. Okay. You know, you can ask me, I, I, and I can answer it. Just uh, uh, there, no, there won't ever be a Chrome Age reunion. Okay. I'm gonna ask you this, and we're gonna throw aggros out the window here, just as strictly, just, just, just Paris Mayhew, me and you talking the music here. If you could be a member in an iconic band. Doesn't matter who it is, what era it is, does not matter. Be one person that band and play one of their legendary shows. Which band would it be on what show, possibly? I, I mean, I, I don't have those kinds of aspirations. That's also why I, to a large extent, didn't play in any bands over all these years because mm. I'm not really interested in playing other people's music. My The joy I get from playing music is writing it and then performing it. You know, it's when I'm at my best. You know, I feel like you, you're given some tools in life that where you can accomplish things. And I've been given this ability to write and record and play music. And uh, I've been offered to play in bands, but the idea of learning somebody else's songs and going up and playing it, it just doesn't ring true to me. Uh, I just don't have that desire. I, I'm, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not something I want to do. And so this idea of... Uh, inserting myself into somebody else's accomplishment doesn't feel i mean there's certainly groups that i admire and uh and i could say and i could pick out a song like trampled underfoot by led zeppelin is the greatest rock song ever written and then and then i and it's beyond me how that song came about i know how i write songs in theory but they kind of happen in this kind of like ethereal you know, sleepwalking way. I, it's really hard to explain to anybody who's never written a song. You just basically look for it and find it. I've, I've never found a song like Trampled Underfoot, uh, but there are so many great songs. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of music. And, you know, I, when I listen to Yes or Rush, I can, I, can, I can give you a laundry list of songs. T for One by Led Zeppelin off Presence is just beautiful. Um, Anything that Nico Case recorded, you know, in her entire career, uh, Van Halen one, Van Halen 1984. Mm -hmm. There's just you know Depeche Mode Violator, uh, Pantera Vulgar Display, Flip oh, yeah. Mode, uh, Iowa. There's so many great. There's so many great astonishing people who who pan for gold. They found something nobody else found, and it's really really cool that they found it. Uh, I, but I, uh, I'm happy finding my own. Folks, Agros has released their debut album entitled Rise of the Agros, and they've also released singles, City Kids, and a remix of Chaos Magic, and it features Chuck Linehan of Crumb Suckers on lead guitar. You want to get out and pick this up. And uh, Paris, how can folks stay in touch with Agros, buy this new album, everything that you're doing? How can they do that, good sir? Well, if... You're so inclined, you could go to our website, which is agros.nyc. You know, mostly it's .com, but ours is agros, A-G-G-R-O-S dot N-Y-C. And we have red transparent vinyl with this beautiful artwork. We have CDs, and we have a Bandcamp page, agros on Bandcamp. And, um, and definitely go to YouTube and look at the videos, you know, get a taste of it first. And then if, if it appeals to you, then you can get the record. It's uh, youtube.com 
slash the agros. And I'm taking the band on the road starting July 5th, starting at, um, at St. Vitus in Brooklyn with my friends Kings Never Die. They are, they're playing on the bill with us. And then we go to Providence and then four dates in Canada, um, Pennsylvania, Philly, D.C., all in July, 10 days in a row. And I'm going to have all these links right here down below in the description so that way nobody can say we don't know where to get this whatever it's right here folks just click on the show more we oh look right there there's more stuff on youtube definitely please you know if you you know like you said you do this podcast to elevate the music and try to connect people one of the things that you could you know the the people out there can do is go to youtube and subscribe to the channel yeah it sounds like a small thing it's cheap it's free uh, it's easy. You just click a button and uh, you, you'll get warnings whenever I release a new video so you can keep up to date with the music. It doesn't uh, interfere with your life at all. No. But the thing is, when booking agents and promoters and stuff like that, when they hear about the aggros or any band, they look at their socials, they look at their YouTube, and they see how many subscribers they have. And the more subscribers you have, the more likely they are to book you. So you are elevating the band by clicking the link. It's like voting for having the band come play in your town. So if you can't go on Instagram and follow and click the subscribe button on YouTube, it's easy, it's free, and you get to see uh, these things that I worked so hard to do for you. And that's why I ask everybody to go like and subscribe to my podcast on here because the, like you said, people go check out my podcast and it's got a large, large amount of subscribers. They're going to be like, look, you need to be on this podcast. They need to be on here anyway, because I can throw down with anybody. I'll say that right now, but uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully James or Lars or this guy will, uh, have heard this podcast and uh, across oh. with them in the past, they're excellent folks and you know, they're big fans of music and yeah. And that's uh, like, that's the thing that brings people to a, a podcast like this. I hope so, man. I do this out of love in my heart. People people might not believe that, but I honestly do. I, I don't, you know, I I want people here that that wants to talk about their music, and uh, I don't care how long it takes. It's a beautiful thing to watch people's expressions on when you talk about what they're working on and how it affects people and. It's just all around beautiful. <laughs> Paris, before I let you go, my friend, would you care to do a promo for my show? Absolutely. This is Paris of the Agros, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. we got some great, great stuff coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour. Please get out and check out our Facebook page. It has that podcast link that you definitely want to go subscribe to, and that YouTube link that you definitely want to subscribe to as well. And that would help me out tremendously if you like what I do. I hope you guys do. And uh, check out Agros. They have released their debut album entitled Rise of the Agros and their single City Kids and remix of Chaos Magic featuring Chuck Linehan of Crumb Suckers Only Guitar. Trust me. Go check this out. It's that old school, kind of hardcore New York style, that roughage that uh, you guys will definitely dig. So, Parrish, thank you so much for taking time out to do this interview with me. I, I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your audience with me. You're listening to Bud's Mayhem Hour. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.